The thing I want to talk about today is when were we actually purchased? When were we actually, when did Jesus Christ actually purchase us? Now look at Psalms 74 verse 2. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. Now the Bible says we were purchased of old. Everybody see that? We were purchased of old. Now obviously, this is Old Testament and before the cross. The cross of Christ is what the death of the testator is what kicked off the New Testament, transitioned us to the New Testament. So this portion we saw was obviously before Jesus Christ died on the cross, okay? So we were purchased of old. We were purchased actually before the cross. It's similar to how the Bible says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. He was slain from the foundation of the world, but was He actually slain at the foundation of the world? Technically, No. Jesus said that he would die on the cross. He told when they concocted salvation's plan at the beginning of the world from the foundation of the world. Jesus told the Father he would go and die on the cross. And since he was God, his word was good. And it was good as done. Amen. It was good as done. Now the same is true with the purchasing power. I'm sorry. The same is true with the purchasing the same is true with purchasing. We were spoken for and purchased thousands of years before the payment was actually made. That's how it worked. We were spoken for and we were purchased before the payment of blood was made. You say, well, how do you purchase? How is it possible to purchase something without paying for it? It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make sense how we were purchased before we were paid for. Well, look, it happens all the time. People purchase stuff without paying for it all the time. It's called credit. Jesus had the best credit score a person can have. Amen. He was good for it. <laughs> he had purchasing power based on his word. Now, another example of how people purchase things without actually paying for them is at an auction. At auctions, people purchase things before they make any type of fin financial transactions. Now, if you've ever been to an auction, you know how it works. If you haven't, I explain it. I will explain it to you. If you go to an auction, maybe a livestock or, or a farm auction, farm equipment auction, or maybe an antique auction or a furniture auction, where I'm from in North Carolina, my mom used to go to a furniture house where they would auction off furniture, auction off antiques, and I'd been there with her. Uh, before. And what you do is you go to these auctions and you get registered. And oftentimes they'll give you a number. And you'll take that number and when you want to put a bid on something, uh, you, you hold your number up. And you say, hey, I'm good for that amount that the auctioneer just called off. You throw your card up. And there's this auctioneer. And he's the guy calling. You probably heard him. He's the guy talking funny, okay? Uh, they call in a way, it, kind of, it really sounds like music. That's kind of what it's designed to be. It's supposed to be like music. Uh, it's like a chant. And the purpose of the chant is to get momentum going, get people motivated. And uh, <clears throat> he'll start the bidding low on an item, and he'll say something similar to this. He'll say, I'll try to do a, a, a bid for you, and I can't do it, but I can't talk fast enough. I'm like Moses. I'm of a slow tongue, and I can't do it fast enough. But he'll say something like this. Bid 20, bid 20, bid $20, bidder now. Bid 30, bid 30, bid $30, bidder now. Bid 20, bid 20, bid $20, bidder now. And he keep, he'll bring it up. He'll, he'll get a bid at $20. Somebody will throw the sign up. He says, all right, I got a 20. And then he's trying to get a 30. And he keeps working his way up. He's trying to get a bidding war going is what he's trying to do. And then he says something like this. He'll say, going once, going twice, sold to number 13. Now, 13, number 13, you know what he did? He just bought it. But is it paid for? It ain't paid for yet, is it? So what does he do? At the end of the auction, he goes and settles the score. I mean, not settles the score, settles the account. He goes and settles the account, amen, at the end of the auction. That's how it works. 
And if you ever, and not every, some auctions you don't even, you just hold, raise your hand. So you got to be careful. You, you if you go to one, you don't pick your nose, man. You get unbought something. Amen. <laughs> now, something similar happened when we were purchased. Now, when Jesus purchased us, it was something similar. Now, we'll not know all the details. We don't know all the details. We don't know exactly how it worked out. We don't know how, exactly how it played out. We'll not know that till we get to heaven. And God keeps us guessing on some things because He don't want us to think we arrived and got it all figured out, number one. And He wants us to be excited about getting to heaven and learning some things and having some things revealed to us. Well, if we knew it all, we, we, we would act like we knew it all. And we'd be strutting around like a turkey. Okay. Now, here's how I imagine it. Here's how I imagine the, 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 the auction, the, the, the bidding process in heaven. Now, here's why I imagine what happened in heaven. The Father was up in heaven and He said, There's going to be sin. We got sin. We got sin now. Somebody done sin. We got sin. We got sin now. Yes, we got sin. We got sin. I need a bidder now. And the angels looked at one another and said, Hey, we can't pay for the sins of the world. And the Father said, I mean, Jesus said, Father... I'll go. Father, I'll go. Father, you can send me. I'll taste death for every man. So you know what the father said? He said, sold. And number 33, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. Sold. Number 33. Amen. We were purchased on credit before the cross. We were actually purchased on credit before the cross. So in the days of old, at the beginning of time, at the foundation of the world, we were purchased, but we were not yet paid for. The payment still had to be made. Uh, the account still had to be settled. Amen. Now go back to Hebrews 9, 12. Hebrews 9, 12. Now for the question. When was the payment actually made? Was the payment made on the cross? Or was it made when he went into the holy place in the tabernacle in heaven and put his blood on the mercy seat? When was the payment actually made? When was the account settled? Was it settled on earth on the cross or was it settled in heaven? Let's read it. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. So this is where the title of the, the sermon comes from. You see eternal redemption. Eternal redemption right there. Well, where did it come from? Where did it come from? See, there was, there was a, that tabernacle that the children of Israel had with the, whole, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, the veil, all that stuff was a picture of the true tabernacle in heaven. God gave Moses a glimpse of that so he could build it. Okay, it was just a mock-up. The one down here on the earth was a mock-up of the one that was actually in heaven. And Jesus did actually take his blood, and he did actually go in, by, in the Holy of Holies in, in heaven and sprinkle his blood. Now, the same verse that tells us he did that also tells us that he had already obtained eternal redemption prior to even doing it. Amen. Prior to going in, he had already had it done, folks. He didn't go in in order to obtain it, but having obtained it, the Bible says. Let's read it again. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So it's not in order to get eternal redemption. Because he already had eternal redemption, he went into the holy place. Amen. Some want to say that the payment for sin was a package deal. They say it was the cross and the resurrection and the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat. No, it wasn't. Black and white, he had already obtained it before he went in. It's already done. It was obtained on the cross. It was obtained on the cross. And I'm going to give you some verses. I'll run some verses on this and I'll prove it to you. You go ahead and turn to Galatians 
Galatians 3.13. While you're turning there, I'll read Matthew 20.28. 20, you're going to Galatians 3.13, I'll read Matthew 20.28. 20, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give and to give his life a ransom for many. We were ransomed. The Lord ransomed us. He bought us. He purchased us. He paid for us. When did He do that? When He gave His life for many. When did He give His life for many? On the cross. <laughs> On the cross. That's where we were ransomed. He ransomed us where He gave His life for many, and that was on the cross. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed to everyone that hangeth on the tree. What's the context there of His redeeming us? The tree. Everybody see that? Amen. The tree. What He did on the tree. Crosses are made out of what? Trees. He redeemed us on the tree. Amen. He redeemed us from the curse on the tree. Now turn to Romans 5, 9. Please, while you turn to Romans 5, 5, 9, I'll read to you Colossians 1, 20. Colossians 1, 20. <clears throat> You're going to Romans 5, 9. I'm reading Colossians 1, 20. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So it says here, we were reconciled by the blood of the cross. Amen. I mean, you don't need more clear than that, folks. That's so clear a theologian could understand it. That's so clear a Bible college professor could understand it. We were reconciled by the blood while on the cross. And let me just say this before we look at Romans 5.9. One of the greatest proofs of the fact that we were purchased by the blood, we were reconciled by the blood on the cross, was the fact that when Jesus yielded up the ghost and died on the cross, what happened? The veil was rent in two. Amen. Now pray tell me if something else had to be, additional works had to be done, additional payment had to be done, Explain to me why that veil was rent. Amen. That's proof, folks. <laughs> if he had more sins to pay for, the veil would not have been rent. Hello! Amen. The veil was rent from top to bottom. Right. Proven. We had access, amen? amen. We had access. Now, some people believe prior to that, my preacher believes what I was taught was that prior to that, Old Testament saints were in heaven, but they were maybe in the outer courtyard. They were kind of somewhat limited in their access to the Lord. And when the veil was rent, they had direct access in heaven to the Father. At uh, unlimited, with no conditions on it. No conditions on it, any time. I'm not saying that's exactly what happened. I, I don't know. But I know when that bell rent, something pretty significant happened. <laughs> and everything was paid for. Amen? Amen. Amen? And we had direct access to the Father through our high priest, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Romans 5, 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood. We should be saved from wrath through Him. Amen. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now let's go back. I want to point out one thing. Let's go back and read verse 9 again. Much more than being justified by His blood, we should be saved from wrath. Through him. Underline that. Say from wrath through him. And then we read verse 10, which says we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So verse 10 clearly says that we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now, where did that death happen? On the cross. Jesus gave up the ghost to be absent from uh, to, uh, the, the, the Bible talks about how when the, uh, the spirit is separate from the body. That's when a person is dead. 
And yes, Christians do die <laughs> physically. You don't have to uh, go to hell to be dead. The Bible uses sleep and death interchangeable for Christians. Jesus told Lazarus that he, Jesus said that Lazarus was dead. Lazarus was a believer. Okay, not only that, but if you want to study Luke chapter 16, the other Lazarus that went to heaven, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham was giving him a big old bear hug in heaven. And the rich man said, can you please, Abraham, please send Lazarus to preach the gospel to my family. What did Abraham tell him? He said, even if one rose from the where? Dead. <laughs> they will not repent. So Christians die physically. We just don't die spiritually. Amen. We die and God likens our death, God likens our physical death unto sleep because it ain't going to be long, we're coming up out of there, amen? amen. It ain't going to be that long, we're coming up out of there. Okay. But verse 10 clearly says that we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. That was the death of the cross. Okay. And we'll see that. We'll further see that, all right, as we go. But... Uh, We'll see that when we get to Philippians. I'm pretty sure we'll see that when we get yeah, we'll see that when we get to Philippians, okay? We'll see that the cross rendered Jesus dead when we get to Philippians. But it says here, we should be saved by his life. So people want to say, see, it wasn't just the blood that atoned for our sins, it was Jesus' life that also atoned for our sins. No. It says we shall be saved by his life. It's not saying that his life atoned for our sins. This is referring to what Jesus is currently doing. Doing now in heaven. See, right now Jesus is acting as our high priest. He intercedes on our behalf. He acts as our interceder. He basically acts as our defense attorney. So God didn't throw the book at us. When we ask for forgiveness for our sins, He intercedes on our behalf. So what is Jesus saving us from now by His life? The life that Jesus is living in heaven now as our high priest saves us from God's wrath. It gets us mercy. Amen. Amen. Every time you see the word save, it's not talking about your soul. Sometimes it's talking about saving your, 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 your backside from getting a, a whooping. Amen. Amen. Saving your flesh. Talking about saving your flesh. Okay. The Bible's crystal clear that redemption was obtained prior to Him going in the holy place in heaven because it was obtained on the cross. That's why the Bible says, by His stripes we are healed. The healing process took place, folks, by them stripes. Amen. Now turn to Philippians 2.9. Philippians 2.9. You say you're preaching on this too much. You pre you've been preaching on the cross too much. You've been pre preaching on the bloody cross too much. Okay, well, while you're turning there, listen to 1 Corinthians 1 23. Paul said, We preach Christ crucified. Not burnt, by the way. We preach Christ crucified. And then he said in 1 Corinthians 2 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. 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 I don't think you can preach on the cross too much, folks. Amen. The cross was the crown jewel of our Savior's. Ministry. The cross was the pinnacle of our Savior's ministry. The cross is everything, folks. Amen. Look at Philippians 2 9. Let's see how just important that cross is. Philippians 2 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now you see that wherefore? That means for this reason. So let's go back, let's back up to verse 8, and let's see the reason that Jesus Christ has the name above every name. Let's see the reason why Jesus Christ has the name that every knee's going to bow to and every tongue's going to confess to. Let's see why Jesus Christ has that name that we love singing about and we love telling people about and that we've been living for and trying to serve these, these many years. Let's see why he's got that highly exalted name. Look at verse 8. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. So the death that Jesus died for many was the death of the cross. Amen. Amen. And that's the reason he has the highly exalted name. His bloody death on the cross. Amen. That's why Jesus assigned him that name. What he did on that cross. Amen. I think it's pretty important. <laughs> and I think the more we understand about it, the more we will appreciate it, and the more we'll be soldiers of it. Amen? Amen. So that's why I'm preaching on it. <laughs> so we'll understand it, and we'll be soldiers of it. Amen? You say, well, if we were bought and paid for on the cross, then why did Jesus have to go into the holy place and sprinkle the blood? If the cross atoned for our sins, if it purged our sins, if it was sufficient to redeem us and purchase us, then why, what was the point? Why did Jesus actually have to go into the holy place and sprinkle his blood? You say, did he? Did he have to go in? And what was the reason? Well, yes, he did. He did have to go into the holy place. You say, well, why? Okay. Now, let me explain it to you this way. This is something that I kind of wrestled with and I kind of struggled with as well. And I prayed about it. Let me share with you what I believe the Lord laid on my heart. <clears throat> I want to compare what Jesus did and why he did what he did to a major league baseball hitter. Okay? Now here's your children's lesson, children. So y'all pay attention. All right? Pay attention. When a hitter hits a ball out of the park, the score is normally advanced before the batter even rounds the bases and crosses home plate. Amen. Now let me ask my son-in-law who's here. He was played college baseball. Is that the case? Is that the way it normally is? The batter hits it out of the park, praise God. <laughs> he hits it out of the park, praise God. And you know what they do? Go ahead and advance the scoreboard before he's even run across home plate. Amen. Amen. See, once that ball is hit out of the park, the only thing that would prevent the score from being granted would be a technicality. Like if maybe that, the, the home run hitter, maybe if he were to engage in violence with another player, or maybe he would pass one of his teammates, a base runner, and he would pass them up. Some kind of technicality. But apart from a technicality, if a hitter hits it out of the park, it's pretty much a guaranteed score. Amen. Guaranteed run. Now, if the hitter was injured, he could walk, he could limp, or he could even crawl around those bases, and no one could get him out. He done hit it out of the park, amen? Done hit it out of the park, no one's going to get him out, amen? Now, in the 19, 1988 World Series, Kirk Gibson had, an injury, had injuries in both of his legs, and he was called upon as a pinch hitter. You know, that's when they get in trouble and pinch hitter. And uh, they're, they're in a pinch. They're in a bind. And they called him out. And it was the bottom of the ninth inning with two outs. And uh, Kirk Gibson hit a two-run walk-off home run to win the game. He hit it into the bleachers. He knocked it into the bleachers. And then he was in so much pain, he just took his time and pretty much hobbled around the bases, man. If you go watch on YouTube, you can tell he's struggling, making it around the bases. All right, but you know what? He took—he barely. He just took his time. He did the best he could. All right. If you ever saw Barry Bonds hit one of his home runs, he usually just casually trotted around the bases. Why was that? They knew the run was good. <laughs> they knew the run was good. Kirk Gibson knew the game was won, and he was pretty much just doing a victory lap. Amen. Pretty much what it was was a victory lap. Amen. The game was won. He had a victory lap to do. Now, let me give you some application. The all-star Jesus Christ, hallelujah. He stepped to the plate at Golgotha Stadium. The devil took his place on the pitcher's mound. And he threw him a curveball. And he made contact with the, with the hitter. He made contact. It hurt him. It bruised him. Though the batter was bruised, he just shook it off. 
And then the devil wound the next pitch up and put everything he had into it. Matter of fact, it was the fastest pitch ever recorded. But the hit was solid. The hit made a sound that was heard around the world. Amen. The world's still hearing about it. The world's still talking about it. Amen. And it wasn't an aluminum bat that he used, but it was one that was made out of a tree. It was a bat made out of a tree, and the old rugged cross sent that bar, ball so far out of the park, it was a splash hit into the water behind the park, amen? And when that ball went in that water, it took our sins with us, amen, right into the sea of God's forgetfulness, praise God. Now, before the hitter had even reached first base, the umpire, God the Father, he told the angels, he said, hey, angels, my boy done hit it out of the park, praise God. He said he's limping around the bases because Satan bruised his heel, but there ain't no stopping him now. He said the run's good. The game is won. My boy will be crossing home plate with the blood soon enough. He said you go ahead and advance the scoreboard by tearing the veil in the temple. Amen. You go ahead and advance the scoreboard. Son of God, home run, devil zero, praise God. Now sure Jesus had to run on those bases. Sure, Jesus had to run the bases. Sure, he had to resurrect. Sure, he had to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Because if he had not done those things, his bloody death, the bloody cross, would have been disqualified by technicality. He'd been disqualified by technicality. But the bottom line is, and the point I'm trying to make this morning, is when Jesus hit it out of the park with the cross, there was no stopping him. Amen. Hey, Mary tried to defile the blood. Jesus said, touch me not. He was too quick for Mary. Yep. Won't no stopping him. Yep. Amen. Won't no stopping him. Once he hit it out of the park, the game was won, praise God. Eternal redemption was obtained.